In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God invites us to come into his presence and to worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil. Hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. Amen. Let us pray. O God, you see that of ourselves we have no strength. By your mighty power, defend us from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Be seated, please. Uh, the the uh, first reading is from uh, Psalms 51. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt, purify me from sin, for I recognize my rebellion, it haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create a clean Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to, rebe to rebels, and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding Blood, O oh God, who saves, then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O oh Lord, that my mouth may praise you. You do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, the epistle reading is from uh, Romans uh, chapter 5. Therefore, 
Since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand, and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us, because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who was especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. This is the word of the Lord. Praise to God. Let us all please rise. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus and his disciples left Galilee and went up to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. As they were walking along, he asked them, Who do people say I am? Well, they replied, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say you are one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, But who do you say I am? Peter replied, You are the Messiah. But Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but three days later he would rise from the dead. As he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Jesus turned around and looked at his disciples, then reprimanded Peter. Get away from me, Satan, he said. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Then, calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Be seated, please. In your hymnals, please turn to page 321. As part of our Go and Be Reconciled uh, series that we're doing during Lent, we're also doing a catechism review. Last week we did baptism. Uh, today we're doing uh, the Ten Commandments. So the way that we're going to do this is I'll state the name. So like the first commandment, then together we'll say 
the first commandment, um, you shall have no other gods. Then I'll say, what does this mean? Then we'll read the explanation and we'll do that uh, through the Ten Commandments. So, the first commandment, you shall have no other gods. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. The second commandment, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not curse, swear, use satanic arts, lie or deceive by his name, but call upon it in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. The third commandment, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. The fourth commandment, honor your father and your mother. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not despise or anger our parents and other authorities, but honor them, serve and obey them, love and cherish them. The fifth commandment, you shall not murder. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and support him in every physical need. The sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do sexually pure life in what we say and do, and husband and wife love and honor each other. The seventh commandment, you shall not steal. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not take our neighbor's money or possessions or get them in any dishonest way, but help him to improve and protect his possessions and income. The Eighth Commandment, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, slander him, or hurt his reputation, but defend him, speak well of him, and explain everything in the kindest way. The ninth commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's homes. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not scheme to get our neighbor's inheritance or house or get it in a way which only appears right, but help and be of service to him in keeping it. The 10th commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not entice or force away our neighbor's wife, workers, or animals, or turn them against him, but urge them to stay and do their duty. The close of the commandments. What does God say about all these commandments? He says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. What does this mean? God threatens to punish all who break these commandments Therefore, we should fear his wrath and not do anything against them, but he promises grace and every blessing to all who keep these commandments. Therefore, we should also love and trust in him and gladly do what he commands. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for having your word carefully preserved for us so that we know your law of what you call us to do and what not to do, but also of your love, your grace in Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, this day as we hear your word, that it touch our hearts and minds, that it leads us to repentance and the newness of life that you have 
prepared for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, last week we focused on remembering whose you are. Uh, you want to put the first slide up there, please? Now, it is good for us to remember that you are a child of God through the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. That is applied to us in the waters of baptism. And uh, it is good to remember that other people are also loved children of God. So uh, we have this cross that we're going through. Uh, the top of the cross is what we did last week. And be reconciled to God. That we implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. So today we're going to be doing the second part, uh, repent before God. Let's see the second slide. And this is leading us to be reconciled to others. That God calls us to be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. So repent before God. You want to put our next slide up there, please? We'll get to that here momentarily. When there is conflict, I think everybody would agree, there is conflict in life, there is sin. Sometimes it can be difficult to identify the sin that we have. Sometimes you think that you did nothing wrong and that it is all of the other person's fault, or you may think the problem is just with, you know, fill in the blank, and my relationship with God is just fine as if it's okay to have conflict with other people, and God just says, eh, it's not a problem. I think it's okay that you are in a conflict. Is it? How do your conflict with others affect your relationship with God? What does conflict reveal about your heart? Huh. Next slide, please. There's got to be an underlying source for conflict that we have. Uh, underlying source, what might it be? In James chapter 4, verse 1, it says, the desires that battle within you. So there is this battle that goes on within our hearts. So where does this sin originate? In Psalm 51, 10, one of our readings today, and then also in Matthew 15, 19, it makes it clear that sin originates in the heart. So when there is conflict, then a heart checkup is needed, and we need to explore our hearts. And the Ten Commandments are a helpful item for us to use in reflecting upon our heart relationship with God, but also in our heart relationship with other people. In the first commandment, it says, you shall have no other gods. Now, I like the way that Martin Luther wrote his explanation. He said, you shall have, or we should fear and love and trust in God above all things. Now, I kind of like the way he did his explanation for all of the commandments that he begins with, fear and love of God. Huh. Fear and love that we need to fear and love the right things in life and the right people. Actually, there's only one for us to fear and love, and that's God himself, and that we trust in him. When we fear, love, or trust in someone or something more than God, we are sinning against God. This is sometimes called an idol of the heart. Now, there are all sorts of good things that we have in life, good things that we want to do, good things that we enjoy. You see, this idol of the heart is simply taking something good and then elevating it to a point where it becomes more important than God. So can our godly intentions be overshadowed by our sinful hearts? Hmm. We all have good intentions. We all have godly intentions. But sometimes we take those good things and we elevate them too high. And then it develops into a problem. 
So here's going to be some examples for you. If you do the next slide, please. So the first one is improper desire for physical pleasure. I think all of you would agree with me that pleasure is an important thing in life. It is an in- I think God wants us to enjoy our life. He has given us certain things in life for us to enjoy. But sometimes we can elevate those too highly. Sometimes this is called a craving, that you think you must have something, that you cannot live without it. When that happens, now it has become an improper desire for that pleasure. And it has become an idol. The second is pride and arrogance. Pride is an important thing for us in our life. Pride helps us to do a good job. It helps us to grow and develop. But a prideful person takes pride too far where it becomes self-centered. And that can be expressed by statements like, I want it done my way, in my time, when I want it, and only my way. And suddenly we put ourselves into the role of God. We start to become judge of others when they don't meet our demands. And these judgments will lead to us passing condemnation or punishment of those who don't serve us. Pride and arrogance can become a problem. Number three, is love of money or material possessions? Do I really need to explain that one? That one I think is just obvious. You can take money or any given thing and elevate it too highly where it becomes the thing that you worship. Number four, fear of man. Now, this one can be a little bit harder to get a grasp of. You see, a healthy attitude includes caring what others think of us. But sometimes we can become overly anxious about what others think. And this is called fear of man. It can lead to a preoccupation with acceptance or approval or seeking popularity or this whole idea of just simply trying to please others. Now, I think it's important to try to satisfy other people and to please them, but you can elevate it too high, and then it becomes fear of man, and that can become an unhealthy thing. Now, good things, number five. We all want good things in life. Have a nice house, have a nice uh, car, uh, education, education, Uh, you you name it, good things in life. There's nothing wrong with that. For that fact, wanting good things that are a blessing from God is good. We should desire that. However, when we turn our desires for good things into a demand, now we have crossed the line. It's when we desire it too much. It's that ninth and tenth commandment of coveting. Good things moving into the role of an idol is like a slippery slope. Next slide, please. So the development of an idol, how do we get to this point? You see, at the top of that slope, you have a fear, a desire, a trust. These are all good things. A godly fear a godly desire, a godly trust. But once we cross that threshold and we move into a demand of what we want, we begin down that slope. And you notice that slope gets steeper and steeper the further you go. When we make a demand, now we've set up an expectation. When your expectations are not met, then you start to experience frustration. When our frustrations increase, then we move into judging others because they don't give us what we want. And if they continue to refuse us, then we move into punishing them. And the end result is the crash landing at the bottom. 
the destruction or the death of a relationship. That's a bad place to be. The devil promises us good things if we will turn from God and seek the desires of our heart. And this is one of the deceptions in this world that is used. The world says, seek the desires of your heart and you shall be happy. Well, it is seeking the desires of our hearts at times that gets us into trouble. It is a great deception. These idols that we elevate will then seek and demand sacrifice. For example, somebody desires a promotion at work. That is a good thing. At least I would hope you guys would agree with me. Getting a promotion at work is a good thing. You should seek something like that. But if somebody uses improper tactics and they go into the realm of using lies or gossip or judgment of others to tear someone down so that you can then be elevated, oh, now you're getting yourself into trouble. What was sacrificed? Personal integrity. Their integrity was lost for the sake of a promotion. And if they got it, sooner or later, somebody's going to find out and they're going to end up losing their job. God calls us to repent of our sins and any idol that we may create in our hearts. And God has prepared in advance for you a great exchange. Through repentance, you can exchange whatever idol you may have, whatever sin it might be, turn it over to God, and he will give you his forgiveness and restore you to a right relationship so that you can worship him once again. What does God require for this? Next slide, please. What does God require for sacrifice? Hmm. Oh, now you can get into all sorts of difficult things here, and sometimes we go down the wrong road. What is it that God desires for us? Next slide. The sacrifice of God or a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. That is the sacrifice. That we take our brokenness and we give it to him. He has given a great exchange or prepared a great exchange for us. He will not reject you or banish you from his presence. He is not going to say, I don't want to talk to you any longer. You see, here's the thing. He knows your sin before you ever confess it. God is simply leading you to recognize and to confess your sins, to simply acknowledge what he already knows. And he wants to give you something good and holy and precious. Next slide, please. A couple of Bible passages that help us to see the blessings that God has in store for us. In John, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and he will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This is what he has prepared for us: a promise that he intends to keep for all people. And in Psalm 51, this was one of our readings today, there's wonderful imagery in there. He is going to wash you clean. He will blot out the stain of your sin. He will purify you and make you whiter than newly fallen snow. You know, that's a beautiful image when we have a new snowfall of how beautiful it is. God has that for us. He desires to give you a clean heart and a new spirit, one that is filled with joy. He desires to give you spiritual renewal, that he take whatever burdens you have away and he replace it with joy and thanksgiving and praise. 
I think that's one of the reasons why people like a lot of the praise hymns, songs. We all have those ones that are meaningful to us. Joy to the world, praise to the Lord Almighty, amazing grace. There's all sorts of them where we get to sing praise to God of what he has done for us. A new heart, a new spirit. Next slide, please. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, it says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. You see, this all happens through the blood of Jesus Christ. He forgives your sins and restores you to the joy of salvation. He changes your heart so that it is willing to follow in his way. He unseals your lips so that you can praise the Lord. He changes your heart. And that is something holy and precious. When you are burdened by the guilt of sin, there is nothing greater than this good news in Jesus Christ. But sometimes we find it difficult to get to that point where we're willing to acknowledge what we have done wrong. We should not be afraid of that because God always, always accepts his people and forgives them of their sins and restores them to a right relationship. And that enables us to change our heart toward other people. It is the love of God that compels you to have a humble heart to have a willingness to reconcile and to work with others, to realize, well, we're no better than anybody else. We're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God, and we all need only what Christ has to offer, that forgiveness in him. That is what encourages us to face whatever conflicts we may have, to work at resolving them in Jesus' name. In his name we pray, amen. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.